Hello, friends, and welcome to worship. We are so glad you all have joined us tonight. Do you have your candle with you? I got mine. Let's turn them on. And let's go right into worship with our first song. Why don't you sing, Oh, Come All Ye Faithful with me. Now, let's watch Zach and Brielle as they light our Advent candles. We live on the brink every day. We stand on the threshold between this world and the next one. We live and move between the ordinary and divine, between the mundane and the mystery. Too often we forget to look up and see the angels in our living room. We forget that the love we give is a and live as a sign of eternity, God with us right now. We forget that company is coming. Luke tells us that God's favor came to a girl, an ordinary girl. It might have been you or your daughter. It might have been the girl down the street or your grandchild. But the messenger of God came and greeted her and said, The Lord is with you. What a gift and a promise. Emmanuel, God is with us. We light these candles with peace in our hearts for the promise of proximity, the nearest of God. We even, even when we forget to listen, to lean into the, that presence. God is as close as our own breath. This is confused and confusing world is a peace that passes all understanding. It is the peace that knows the company is coming. Oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel. Will you join with me in an opening prayer? God, be with us tonight as we learn more about what this Advent season means in our lives. Help us hear the message of your word. Teach us how to be Advent people all year long. Amen. So, Beth... Do you have all your Christmas shopping done? I do. I have all the Christmas shopping done. I'm waiting for about two more packages in the mail, and then I have a few to wrap. Do you have all your Christmas baking done? Yes. Thank you, Mother. All of our baking is done. Is your house all decorated and ready for Friday, the big day? Well, we have our Christmas tree up, but we didn't really decorate much 
we've got four tiny hands around the house, so it was just easier to do the tree with some lights this year. Have you taken time to just sit and take quiet time and reflect on why we celebrate Christmas? I have been able to do that while watching the service at home with my family. That's when I'm really able to listen to your message and let all of that sink in. And I really liked last week's sermon, Lisa, when you talked about why we decorate our homes. So thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad it helped. It sounds like you're getting along pretty well this season. I have to admit to you guys that Beth and I have maybe a little bit of a fair advantage, if you will fair advantage. Actually working at a church helps a person to focus on the reason why we celebrate Christmas. It's not that we aren't as busy as the next person, but we've had many of our thoughts and much of our work centered around the birth of Jesus since way back in like October, I think. I can confess I don't have all my Christmas shopping done yet, and I haven't even gotten to the baking. It may or may not happen, I don't know. Our home's decorated, a little less flair than some years, because just like Beth, we have tiny hands in our home as well, so the tree only has lights on it, and any decorations that I've put on shelves start just out of Miss Ellie's reach. It can be hard to stay focused on the reason why we celebrate Christmas, can it? The hustle and bustle of this busy time of year often causes people to lose perspective on why we celebrate Christmas. I mean, we all know that Christmas is the celebration of the birth of the Savior of the people of the world, but this world has made it so much more. It often can be difficult to remember that even without presents, without cookies, and without decorations, Christmas will come. God will still be with us, even if we don't acknowledge him. Jesus will still have saved us from our sins, even if we don't take time to remember that in the midst of all the craziness we put ourselves through this time of year. Why do we do it? Why do we go through all of this work during Christmas? We do it because company is coming and we want the house to look nice. Yeah, that might sound shallow, but it is what motivates us, appearances. It's not supposed to sound shallow though because there is something important going on in all of our busy work. In the desire to present a welcoming home, a home of joy, and light, full of the sights and sounds and smells of the season, there's something profound being said about the nature of Christmas itself. Appearances. How would it look if your guests showed up before you got everything just right? How would it look if the company walked in and found the boxes you dragged down from the attic or up from the basement not put away yet, and the decorations strewn all across the floor? How would it look if the company walked in and found the kitchen a mess because the kids had to help with the baking, and the tree a mess because the cat keeps knocking the ornaments off of it, and mom and dad's tempers are running short, and the strain is beginning to show and they're yelling, if you play Jingle Bell Rock one more time, I'm not going to be responsible for my actions. How would it look? This habit of looking at the surface, at how things appear, has been going on forever. In the Bible, we read about this happening way back in the time of King David, way back in the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we read, When King David was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, the king summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David said, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Go ahead and do whatever you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. 
But that same night, the Lord said to Nathan, Go tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet, no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people Israel. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? Now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on this earth, and I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past, starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. How would it look? That was essentially the question that David asks himself in the scripture passage. We find him relaxing in his lazy boy throne, watching the Philistines lose to the Amalekites in the fourth quarter. And he happens to glance out the window into the backyard and sees what God has been living in. And he thinks, how does this look? Here I am living in my brand new house with the full finished basement, bathrooms on every floor, walk-in closets and a three-car garage, and there's God living in a pop-up trailer in my backyard. There's something not right here. Or maybe it was his grumpy wife who told him she didn't like the look of God's camper next to her rose bushes, and ever since God strung up those lights on the canopy... It's starting to look like a trailer park out there. David asks himself, how does it look to have me in here and God out there? He comes to the conclusion that this doesn't look good, in fact. So David says, well, we've just got to build God a house. And Nathan, who runs messages back and forth from the camper to the palace, agrees at least until he walks out to the backyard and has a word with God, and God says, no, I'm kind of partial to the pop-up camper. I like being able to go where the people are, to be on the move. I don't want to be tied down with the maintenance worries that home ownership brings. I prefer to be able to run out in front to head off the bad guys at the pass. And who is the one in the home building business anyway? Wasn't it I who led you home to the promised land? Wasn't it I who made you safe enough to build your tri-level ranch-style palace? I'm the one in the home establishing business, not you. In fact, you might say, that is my main motivating factor in all this chosen people stuff in the first place. To make a home. A home for you and my people and through you to make a home for the whole world. God says, come home. That's the offer God makes to David. Come home, home to me, home to your true self, home to your true family. That's what God is really talking about, home. David is talking about building a house, and God wants to talk about finding a home. God built in all of us this desire for home, and maybe at Christmas this desire for home is a little bit stronger or a little bit closer to the surface. 
And sometimes we have to move heaven and earth to get there, and it upsets our routines, and we'll wonder on occasion whether it's worth it. And yet we go, or they come, or we find a new place. God told David that David wasn't going to build God a home, and it said in the verses that we skipped over in 2 Samuel that David's son was going to do it. So David and everyone else thought that God was talking about Solomon because Solomon did indeed build a temple as a home for God. At least that's what everyone thought God meant. Everyone but Luke. Luke reminds us that God had different ideas than the rest of us. Solomon's temple was quite a structure and God apparently liked it well enough, but it was never really God's home. Maybe that's why it was always called Solomon's Temple. God had a different son in mind when he said, your son will build my home. God was thinking of the one that Gabriel would call the son of the Most High, the one that would reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there would be no end. That's the son who would build God's home. No one quite got that, though. David didn't really understand what God meant. Solomon didn't understand either, but he got the construction crew out and built anyway. No one knew what God really meant. No one but Mary. In the book of Luke, chapter 1, we read, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby will be born and holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. But then the indications are that Mary didn't really understand either. How could she? Can you imagine this young, unmarried, but engaged girl gets a message from God telling her that God is coming home, taking up residence in her This nothing special, small town teenager was going to be God's home for a while. Can you imagine getting word that a guest was arriving in this manner? Those who are mothers, who have experienced the joy of pregnancy and birth, know best the hard reality of an event of this sort. We need to take time to remember that Mary carried this load much like every woman does. She hurt, she sweated, and she paced. She groaned, and she struggled. She wondered, and she worried. She bled, and she gave birth in a barn because no one was willing to give her a bed. Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. The Lord has a different idea of favoritism than we do. The Lord has a different idea of blessing than we do. And the Lord has a different idea of home than we do. 
Come home, says the Lord to us at Christmas time. David wanted to build a house for God on the tallest hill in Jerusalem where God could be removed and distanced and overlook all the people who would have to go out of their way to give obedience to God. But God wanted to build his home a little closer to the deep realities of living in this world so that we could be surprised by God where we live. God wanted to build his home where we work and play where we laugh and cry, where our hearts are lifted up and often broken and sometimes healed. David wanted God's home on a mountain, but God wanted his home in the womb of a girl, in the feed box behind an inn in the little town of Bethlehem. God wanted his home in the backwoods region of Galilee, and on the roads of the countryside and in the grassy place where 5,000 people sat and ate their fill of bread and fish. God wanted his home to be in the birthing rooms and wedding celebrations and dinner parties. He wanted his home to be in the tear-filled bedrooms and the sick beds and the graveyards of his children. God wanted his home in the courtrooms and the prison cells, and then on the streets of sorrow of Jerusalem and the dark hill called Calvary. God wants his home in your home, in the living rooms and kitchens and playrooms and bedrooms of your life. God calls to us each Christmas and says, Greetings, favorite ones. I'm coming home, coming home for Christmas. Is there room for me in your crowded, busy lives? Is there room? And like any baby born in our midst, he says, I won't take up much room, just all that you have. Is there room for me? I'm coming home. Please remember, friends, that we are of Advent, not in Advent. We don't simply reside in the season, we become it. We live it and announce it and celebrate it. We are not simply remembering a story from long ago, but living in the presence of Emmanuel, God with us today. We see the mess, join the cleanup crew, deck the halls, and now we wait on the threshold, right at the edge of our doorway, and we shine our lights for the world to see. We shine our lights so that others will know company is coming.
are so honored to have you here with us tonight. Before we go, let's join in our benediction. Who are we? We are a missionary force of Christians. And what do we do? Offer the care and compassion of Christ. To whom? To all. And where do we meet you? Wherever you are in life's journey. From our home to yours. And from all the staff at DLUMC. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas! See you guys next week.